It's Helping Hand, weekly feature airing statewide on HPR One stations every Friday afternoon, part of our afternoon drive broadcast of All Things Considered, and then appearing online at hawaiipublicradio.org. Every week, Helping Hand puts a spotlight on an organization, topic, or event that offers assistance to the disabled and to others among the most vulnerable. Aloha, I'm Dave Lawrence. Thank you very much for joining us. This week, we are continuing our series within Helping Hand about the Rhino Extinction Crisis of Poaching. It's rooted by demand for rhino horn primarily in Vietnam and China. To stop the impending extinction of wild rhinos around the globe, many efforts are underway, from attempts to increase security of the rhinos to strategic relocation to safer areas. Also, trying to change the behavior of those causing the carnage, which is our topic today. Traffic is a non-governmental organization that works globally on trade in wild animals and plants in the context of both biodiversity conservation and sustainable development. Traffic is a strategic alliance between the World Wildlife Fund and the International Union for Conservation of Nature. They've recently launched the second phase of their CHI, or Strength of Will, initiative. It's intended to decrease demand and help change behavior in Vietnam, where an affluent segment of society consumes rhino horn largely as a sign of status or wealth, despite the horrific realities of the genocide of rhinos and violence waged to get the horns. We are privileged to learn more about their work with the Country Director for Traffic in Vietnam, Madeline Willemson. Thank you, Madeline. Aloha and welcome. Thank you very much. It's good to get to talk with you. And for the folks who have never heard of the organization Traffic, tell us about the organization and what it does. Well, you did a very good introduction, David. Um, We are an international non-government organization. Our headquarters are in the UK, in Cambridge, and we have six other international offices around the world. We in Vietnam are part of the Traffic Southeast Asia region with our headquarters based in Kuala Lumpur and We have about 150 staff working all over the world to monitor wildlife trade, uh, wildlife trafficking, to educate people, to work with governments on policy and strengthening law enforcement efforts as well as laws and do that all through evidence-based approaches. So the data collection of the wildlife trade, the data collection of consumers of illegal wildlife is very important for us to base our efforts on and our direction of our work on. Where does traffic get its funding? We get funding from a wide range of sources. Traffic, we have funding from government. So we work under the UK government on the demand reduction. We receive funding from our colleagues, like you said, um, traffic is a strategic alliance between WWF and IUCN. Our WWF colleagues provide us with funds for different projects, especially demand reduction. We get our funding from philanthropic people that want to do something good for wildlife trade and want to protect conservation, biodiversity, because it is one of the biggest threats to biodiversity, the wildlife trade. At the end, we'll be giving out your contact information. It's traffic.org, though, for folks who are listening along and want to take a look at it and are compelled to make a contribution. As for yourself, how long have you personally been involved in efforts to stop the slaughter of rhinos? I am a conservationist from background. My career started working in zoos as a behavioral biologist and worked as a general manager looking after seven southern white rhinos in Zeus Victoria before I was engaged in this job in Vietnam. So I'm very much concerned about conservation. I'm also doing a PhD on conservation and the management of conservation. So I haven't been really working on rhinos in particular, but very much on reducing the threats to biodiversity, which includes rhinos, Australian animals. I spent most of my professional career in Australia, which I call home. I was born in the Netherlands, but I've always had a keen interest for rhinos. They're beautiful animals. I've <laughs> a, a, a very interesting story. In my zoo time, we would have seven rhinos living on this large open range field, and sometimes they would lie on the road because it was nice and warm, and we would have to nudge them 
gently with our ute <laughs> to get them out of the way so we could actually get them up and get past them. <laughs> because, you know, I, uh, just off the road it was very boggy, so we couldn't actually go off the road. And they're very gentle giants, and that's why it's so easy for them to be slaughtered and have their horns cut off in their range states. That's a great description. Gentle giants, for sure, is what, Gentle I, giants, yeah. is what I've come to learn about them. Obviously, it sounds like you have some care for them. What makes you most upset, Madeline, about the current rhino well, crisis? Well, there's a few different levels. First of all, of course, I love animals. I think animals are awesome in the real meaning of the word, and not in our proper sense of the word. Biodiversity, nature, it's extremely important. So it makes me really upset that people do things to harm nature and harm our biodiversity. I hate seeing animals suffer, so that is definitely a big part of this as well. But what really drives me in this job, because as soon as I start thinking about rhinos being killed every day, I wouldn't be able to do my job. What really drives me, because I would be really upset and would go under trying to stop that, what really drives me is trying to address the crime that is associated with this, trying to work with government to change their norms when it comes to allowing and almost reinforcing criminal activities such as rhino horn trade. That is what really drives me, because I think we can break the supply chain of the illegal rhino horn through addressing different levels here in Vietnam, and that is behavior change to consumers, but it's also government officials who play a large role in in <laughs> endorsing <laughs> letting these sort of illegal trade opportunities slip through through the webs um, that they have set up. That's what makes me most passionate. That's what, that's what drives me. What makes me very upset is, yeah, animals um, being killed. How long have you been based in Vietnam? I've been here for over a year and a half. Now, I'm very fortunate to have a team of Vietnamese people working very closely with me. I've got 10 Vietnamese staff that drive all our projects. I sign <laughs> the receipts and liaise with, with government officials. I don't speak Vietnamese. It's a very hard language. So I'm very lucky to have such a great team that is really engaging and really understands the problem and can negotiate with our government partners as well as with the consumers. In the United States, uh, Madeline, the rhino extinction crisis gets virtually no attention in the media. And for uh, that's one of the reasons that I try to do this feature is to give them a consistent source of exposure during the middle of afternoon drive, at least here in Honolulu, and then the pieces end up online. For those who are new to the dire nature of the current rhino crisis, can you explain the threat that rhinos face as you see it? Yes. Well, it's simply poaching. But the key threat is that wildlife criminals, I'm just going to call them wildlife criminals, see it as an opportunity to make an easy, well, an easy buck. There is some knowledge that illegal wildlife trade is supporting terrorism. Obama has driven that point before. We haven't really got any strong proof on that as yet, but definitely it harms the security of countries. And it really sets up a strong illegal network where a lot of money is being made and moved between countries. And that is the biggest threat because it's very hard to stop criminal activity. It's a challenge because criminals are very clever people. They always find ways around it. And we have seen the poaching and the techniques that rhino horn poachers use change over the years. And they have been very innovative in trying to not get caught. And clearly, the risk isn't high enough through enforcement laws because they continue to do it. The benefits they receive from doing this are way higher. So the biggest threat to rhinos, I think, is that we're not strong enough. We're not effective enough in the law enforcement when it comes to every actor so that goes from poachers in the range states to consumers, to people in the middle that transport and supply it to consumers, the suppliers, I should say, there's just not enough risk for them to not continue with this illegal activity.
as we turn to this innovative approach that you guys have, do you have a sense for how many people in Vietnam understand that rhino horn is made of keratin, like people's hair and fingernails, and actually does not have any kind of medicinal or other properties? Do you have an idea how many folks actually get that point? We think that a lot of people do get that point, but that understanding doesn't drive the motivation. It's really Vietnam, Vietnam, Asian cultures and Confucianists, Confucianist countries um, have a very interesting cultural perspective where knowledge is transferred more through peer groups than through schooling systems. And especially in Vietnam, if somebody of more authority tells you that this is true or somebody that you aspire to, to be like tells you that this is true, you will take that as knowledge. You won't go on Google and find out what the real answer is. People ask me, is this true? Is this right? And we do say yes. Indeed, it's keratin. It doesn't have any other medicinal properties. It's actually proven that it doesn't have any medicinal properties. The CITES, which is the Convention of International Trade of Endangered Species, which most of the endangered species who are involved in trade are listed in appendices. And the CITES scientific authority did research in the scientific papers that were published by the Chinese mostly on the medicinal purposes of rhino horn, and there clearly aren't any medicinal purposes. Some of these papers have said that they are, but looking at their methodologies, you can pick lots of holes in that. <laughs> and we know that from the most prolific rhino horn consumers, which are the businessmen here in Vietnam, that only 6% believes that rhino horn actually has medicinal purposes. So the other 94% consume rhino horn because of other reasons, not because it cures their diseases. Right, and and we're about to hear more about that. That's obviously a, a key ingredient. And before we get to that, just a couple more questions to paint a picture of Vietnam. When it comes to consumption, is Vietnam the top destination anywhere in the world for rhino horn? Well, that's interesting. We know that Vietnam is one of the most prolific consumers. We also know that there's lots of rhino horn being trafficked between the borders of China and Vietnam. So we can't definitely say that that's the case, but we do know that when the Vietnamese status of living increased, the GDP started rising around 2009, that poaching increased with about 6,000%. And that is clearly correlated to that. The Chinese seem to have a much more traditional approach to consuming rhino horn, much more about the medicinal value of rhino horn. So there's always been a low poaching number, 10 to 12 animals poached each year in South Africa uh, up until 2009. And then from 2009, it started really clearly, sharply rising and also started noticing people here in Vietnam consuming it because of lots of other reasons than medicinal use. Yeah, that does seem to be a uh, the key tipping point coming in 2008, I guess, was the first year that, yeah, it, yeah. that it really ramped up. Thinking about Vietnam, is the sale of the rhino horn something that's done in privacy? And can you explain the forms that the rhino horn most commonly comes in when it comes to Vietnamese consumers buying it? Yes, it's bought in pieces, so it's bought in either whole horn or in smaller pieces. Uh, done in privacy is a good question. We know that traditional medicine practitioners openly sell it. You can ask for it. We know that you can buy it on the street. The Vietnamese government made it illegal. The Prime Minister wrote a directive and the Prime Minister of Vietnam, the previous Prime Minister of Vietnam, really was very strongly in addressing the illegal trade of rhino horn and ivory. So, yes, it must be done in privacy because It is illegal to do it openly, but lots of open trade. I can go to the local shop and ask in English, do you have rhino horn because I want to give it to my Vietnamese friends. People will sell it to me. They will sell it to you? Yeah. Wow. Well, that's very frightening, and that does paint a a very sad picture for these animals. Mm -hmm. 
Unlike cocaine or other substances, though, Madeline, is there any way for a consumer to even verify the substance they're being sold is real rhino horn? Assuming that it's not in a big piece and that it's in some sort of powder, would anyone even be able to tell that that's what it is? No, they won't. And that is one of the main concerns why people may not decide to, con- to consume rhino horn because they just don't know if it's the real thing. And it's especially in Vietnam because the culture is based on what people think and what people feel. Being doubtful if this is real is a really important part of avoiding people to consume it. So no, they can't test it's real. And I mean, that's definitely a big concern for the consumers. How would a person know? You mentioned the very, hor- I mean, frightening that you can literally yourself go out and purchase it. The example you gave is just jaw-dropping. But how would a person like myself, for example, if somebody like me came there, how would I know where to buy it? Well, there are streets in Hanoi. There are streets in Ho Chi Minh. It's about your contacts. I'd like to add another one to the previous question about do they know it's real and what forms comes it in. There is there is knowledge about where a whole rhino horn, so that's a large amount of money that people order in. It takes about 48 hours for a horn to arrive from butchering the animal in the range states in Africa somewhere to arrive here in Vietnam. And if you're really wealthy, you demand an ear and a tail and a photo of the dead rhino so that you can show your friends that you are really wealthy and of high status to have this done for you. That's a really worrying and nasty part of society that we really need to address. Yeah, that is, uh, I've never even heard that before. So she's basically just said that really affluent people to, on the note of trying to make sure that they're not getting something fake, they will demand an ear, a tail, and a photo of the animal that's been murdered to provide it, correct? Correct. That is upsetting. When we think about this traffic initiative, which couldn't be a more appropriate thing to try to do, considering uh, the horrible nature of what we're talking about, share with us how this G or Strength of Will program tackles the demand side. And if you can, back us up and start with the first phase that preceded this second phase of the initiative. Yeah, well, and I actually have to take it a little bit further back because we found out As conservationists, we always talk about the plight of the animals. So we see rhinos going extinct, and we don't want rhinos to go extinct because we care about biodiversity, and we know it's important. If you don't care about biodiversity, and I'm just using this in a very sense, if you don't, if you care more about your own immediate benefit, you need to look at a different approach to make people see it because just telling them about rhinos going extinct in Africa, stop consuming rhino horn, protect the rhino. People here in Vietnam, the people that consume rhino horn, and please don't, it's not all people because there are a lot of people in Vietnam that do very much care about this as well, but the rhino horn consumers do not care about animals being slaughtered, animals going extinct. I often get asked a question, why does it matter if a rhino goes extinct? Well, for a lot of reasons. First of all, we are an ecosystem that has lots of integrate connections, so we don't really know what happens if the rhino go extinct. Too many animals going extinct, our ecosystem might collapse, and we don't want that to happen. And rhinos are awesome. They should never go extinct because we want to consume animals. We should not be so authorian, have such a use of our ecosystem that we can make species extinct just because we want to improve ourselves or be better. And that's a really interesting question. So that's why Traffic developed a behavior change approach that is intended to reduce consumption and demand for endangered species. And that's a, an evidence-based approach that has, has five steps. And the first two steps are very much about understanding why the consumer is are consuming, let's say, rhino horn in this case. What is their motivation? What drives them to buy this rhino horn? Who buys it for them? Do they buy it themselves? When are they consuming it? And from there, you start looking through social marketing techniques, what would increase the barriers for them to change the behavior and increase benefits for them as well to adopt 
the desired behavior, which is not consuming rhino horn, and we want them to really stop consuming rhino horn. And we found that that is actually, these people do not care about rhinos in the wild. They only care about the status. And that's the most prolific group of rhino horn consumers. That is the wealthy businessmen that use rhino horn as an opportunity to show to their peers to buy respect from superiors by gifting it and to go out with friends and be impressed by their friends that can have rhino horn to drink for a hangover, a hangover cure, because that's one of the most common uses of rhino horn for a hangover cure. So it's a really interesting approach. From there, we would understand what the motivations are of the consumers. From there, we would develop a behavior change strategy that would increase that barriers, like I said, again, to use it. Because Vietnam, like I said before, doesn't have any, well, it's very weak law enforcement in place. So people that consume rhino horn wouldn't be prosecuted, even if there is confiscations taking place, less than 1% actually is fined or gets prosecuted. So we do know that that doesn't do anything here in Vietnam, so we need to find another way, and that is behavior change, reduce demand through behavior change. So we develop a behavior change strategy that is really targeted and focuses on the most prolific group of rhino horn consumers, and that became Qi. And Qi is very much about the strength comes from within. You do not need to consume any other product to become successful. You do not give rhino horn because it actually gives you less respect. Your masculinity, which was the first, we had four key messages in the first stage about masculinity, about your business success, about being a successful man in life, are really much based on your own strength and not an external property such as rhino horn. And that really seemed to engage the business community. They really felt that message That message touched them. That message was important to them. That message made them think about, oh, well, actually, yeah, people are right. It's me who's done this. I should be proud of me. I should sell me better rather than show that rhino horn made me. And that worked. And throughout the first and the second phase, we're trying to really get some champions, change actors, wealthy, successful businessmen in Vietnam that are really helping us to drive that message because people look up to these people. So that's really important. We've also developed a whole range of tools that engages the business community, a corporate social responsibility guide that is really concentrating on integrating a more environmental practice of environmental code of conduct into the business, which is really focusing on the zero tolerance to rhino horn consumption, of course, but it really encourages businesses to start looking at this and showing the benefits of adopting CSR practices because it actually makes their business better. It increases the value of their business. It increases their bottom line. It decreases their profits. And businessmen are really interested in that. So throughout all these different tools, we deliver a very wide, broad package of behavior change messages among the business community and work closely with government departments, such as the Central Committee for Propaganda and Education, to look at how we can, they censor all the news and media in Vietnam and bring uh, propaganda messages to the public. So we're working with them on trying to engage the public and the businessman community with behavior change messaging. We're working with the Vietnamese Chamber of Commerce and Industry to really integrate the zero tolerance to endangered wildlife consumption throughout the whole of the business community in Vietnam. So it's a very complex project program we're doing here. But yes, it's a long story on how Qi developed and what we're doing. (laughs) Well, it's an important one to get out there, though, because there are, in studying it, and when I share it with listeners, there are a number of ways this is being approached. It's not just a matter of providing extraordinary security to the animals on the ground. It's not just a matter of potentially moving several insurance policies to a better place. It's also changing behavior. And you got into some of that. And I understand that you guys get the word out. You've done billboards. You've done a very innovative boarding pass slip approach where when 
these businessmen are traveling. The boarding pass comes with the Chi logo and with information about the campaign in, in the little envelope that you're handed right when you're about to get on the plane. But thinking about something you said where there's no prosecution of the users in Vietnam, let's just suppose that if somebody was busted with this stuff, the threat of going to jail for 20 years to life was on the table. Do you think that if there were stronger penalties that were associated with it, that that would create a barrier to people using it? Definitely. Definitely. And it's really important that law enforcement is used as a barrier. And you just mentioned the supply chain. So it's not only important for coaches in range states, but all the steps of the supply chain up to the end consumers really, they're all involved in illegal behavior. So they should all be prosecuted in some manner or form and effective law enforcement really needs to break that supply chain. As soon as we can break the supply chain in some manner or form and demand reduction is just one of those, behavior changes is one of those, but law enforcement will be very strong to increase the risk to any of these criminals along that whole supply chain, including the consumers, will be really important to increase that risk and to really discourage either the poaching, the trafficking, or the consumption of rhino. And it's really important. Unfortunately, Vietnam is very weak in law enforcement. The laws and regulations are extremely weak and full of holes. They have 19 laws that regulate the environment, and they're all regulated by different departments who do not talk to each other. And they were in the process of revising the penal code, which actually increased the opportunity for law enforcement for endangered wildlife, but because and that wasn't only for endangered wildlife, but also for money laundering and other crimes that were taking place in Vietnam. But because just two days before they were about to get the code in force, the penal code in force, they saw that there were a lot of mistakes in the penal code. It doesn't appear to have any mistakes in the environmental protection part, but in the other areas it does. So they delayed the code, which is sort of good for us because the penal code actually allows up to 50 grams of rhino horn and up to two kilos of ivory not to be a criminal offence. So those offences, if people get caught with 49 grams of rhino horn or 49.99 grams of rhino horn, people wouldn't be prosecuted under this criminal code. They would just be prosecuted under the existing law framework that doesn't do anything. So we can see occasions arise where somebody would come in on the airport and would have 10 bags of 50 grams of rhino horn or 49 grams of rhino horn and would say, oh yeah, no, no, I've got 10 family members. That would just get confiscated and they wouldn't be prosecuted. Yes, law enforcement is really important, but while there is no law enforcement in Vietnam and while the Vietnamese government isn't really prepared to accept that Vietnam is a key player in the illegal wildlife trade. They're working, they're trying to improve it. Behavior change is really our only tool here in Vietnam. And finding the right government officials that are really wanting to drive and work with you, and there are plenty of them, but then there's some really rotten ones as well. I have no doubt, and it's just a shame. I never thought that I would ever in my life praise, as an example, Indonesia's approach to dealing with drug smuggling. But if there was any way that Vietnam would choose to treat the possession of the rhino horn the way that a country like Iran or Indonesia would treat drug smuggling, I can imagine it would change people's motivation very rapidly if they realized that they would potentially be executed for possession of something, which I've got to believe. Again, it's not something that when I report on it in the news, it always seems like it's a real backward country where they're executing people for some sort of drug smuggling thing. But when it comes to something like this, I could see how it could really ratchet up the pressure. Uh, you mentioned something yeah. You mentioned something very interesting uh, when you talk about changing people's behavior when you don't have laws like those to help you, and, and you got to use innovative campaigns like yours. Are there any Vietnamese celebrities, public figures, people like that who have been so outraged by the killing that they have joined your efforts to change public perception? Yes. Yeah. We've been very lucky. We've had very, very successful businessmen because the Chi campaign is a very t- 
targeted behavior change initiative. It's very much about bringing the right message to the right people. So just having somebody famous doesn't really work for businessmen. Having a famous singer doesn't really appeal to these businessmen because this person is just a singer, so they're not doing the same that they do. But we have Mr. Son. He is our new face of the Chief Face 2. He is a very successful businessman. He's an actor. He's a film producer. And he really sort of embodies what the modern businessmen in Vietnam can achieve without any... You know, just living healthy and not using any endangered species such as rhino horn. We were very lucky to have Kai Silk, who is a successful tailor and was the first person to have a, well, I was told by uh, by my Vietnamese staff, the first person to have a Rolls Royce here in Vietnam. So he's a very wealthy and successful businessman, completely self-made from a poor tailor family to a successful silk emporium making beautiful clothes as well as exporting and producing lots of silk products. And we have lots of other people that are... uh, Do Ming, he's a composer, an international renowned composer, and there's lots of other people that have aligned themselves and haven't given their name to our initiative to show their support and to encourage businessmen that would admire their strengths to start living the way they do and start adopting their norms when it comes to zero tolerance or wildlife consumption. What about the use of children? I would imagine, kind of like in the United States, in the same way that U.S. kids who were exposed in the 70s and 80s to the plight of the harp seal and of whales became, to some degree, advocates for those animals and were outraged at the way they are treated. You would imagine, because a lot of these business people, one would assume, are parents, are children at all used as a vehicle? Because I would assume assume that if any child saw a video of what one of these rhinos goes through, which is not a simple killing, in some cases it can drag on for days and days with horrific wounds that must be agonizingly painful, one would assume that children would cringe and be outraged from that, that they could be a natural vehicle to sort of reach their parents. Yes, well, that would assume that our Western society, where children are used, for these messages and our important vehicles to drive their parents' decisions is the same here in Vietnam. And unfortunately, that's not the case. Vietnam is a very hierarchical-based society. And if somebody's older than you, you have a different label. So if somebody older for a man or a woman, a woman gets called Chi and a man gets called Eng. Everybody younger than this person gets called M. So you're not taking on advice or direction from somebody younger than you. So parents wouldn't necessarily listen to their children. So yes, I agree, children have a very important role to play in the development of a country and they need to be properly educated, they need to be properly told about the effect of their behaviors on the environment and they're going to be the future change agents of any society for that matter. But unfortunately in Vietnam, it's not the children that have an effect on their parents. I did an interview with a Dutch biologist, Freek Funk, his name is, and he went to visit a rhino horn consumer and was shown how rhino was being grinded in a bowl and then how it was drunk. And he asked a question to this man. So what do your children think? And he basically said, well, I don't tell my children. I don't tell my children because my children don't agree. So he knew that. He knows that. But he isn't changing his behavior. Another example, we did an event with the Ministry of Health in a very conservative area in Vietnam. And we, I was there and the local traditional medicine administrator, the chair of that department was there and his daughter was studying in Melbourne and because I'm from Australia, she came and had a chat with me and she told me that she was very happy that her father was doing this workshop with traffic. And I asked her, well, why? And she said, well, my father practices traditional medicine and he's a traditional medicine practitioner and he prescribes rhino horn. And I said, oh, to whom? And he said, well, he mostly prescribes it to children that have a fever, but he also prescribes it. He also sells it to businessmen and born people. And she said, I tell him that this is not the right thing to do. 
but her father doesn't change his behavior. And even during, during that workshop, we had him and his six other companions of that department basically crossing their arms saying, yes, rhino horn has a very important place in traditional medicine, which is entirely untrue, but it has a very important place in their way of life. Right. So even though children are important, they're not going to be the vehicle in Vietnam that is going to change this urgent crisis of poaching rhinos. Well explained. The flip side of that, and I get what you're saying, that they kind of just out of hand disregard the comments of the children and they know that the kids don't agree with them. When it comes to the individuals, as I kind of describe the horrific way that these animals are killed, which is graphic, it's violent, it's the kind of violence that is shocking to witness. There's no way to shame these people through taking a look at the videos or the carnage. They're not personally... I guess what I'm saying is it's one thing to say that you want to use the stuff, but it's another thing when somebody puts a two-minute video of a rhino dying that way in front of you. They don't have any kind of sense of personal responsibility that a creature is suffering in this way to acquire the horn. Short answer? <laughs> no. Um, it's very hard to understand. Vietnam is very much still a developing country and cultures is very much developing and continuously conflicted between a Confucianist and Asian culture to aspiring to be a Western culture. Suffering of animals, welfare of animals, isn't very high on the list of concerns here in Vietnam. Just to give you a quick example, people eat dog meat here, which isn't a problem on itself because dogs are domestic animals. I have no problem with people eating dog meat. But what I do have a problem with is that there is this wife's tale that a dog needs to be suffering for its meat to be nice and tender and tasty. So what happens in some of these dog restaurants is that these dogs are being beaten with sticks and being kept in horrific circumstances so that they are then being butchered and put on the barbecue. The other thing is bear bile. There is bears, Asian black bears, sun bears and moon bears being kept in horrific tiny cages and they have a catheter stuck in their stomachs to milk the gallbladder so that people can know that the bear ball that they buy is real and they would just go at the back of a illegal backyard bear farm and would see the bear ball being milled straight from the bear. So they know it's indeed real and what they're purchasing. We, in regards to rhinos, like I said, really affluent people get a till and an ear and a picture of a killed rhino. There is some evidence through our qualitative surveys that it actually makes these consumers feel powerful. Look what we've done. We have so much money. I've got so much status and control over this that I can have an animal that is big and beautiful butchered. So it's actually, it actually is completely the opposite from what we think. Wow, that is, um, it really is upsetting. It really uh, really makes you just want to move all these animals right right out of where they are and put them into some sort of pen where they can be secured by the U.S. Marines or something, because it's really... <laughs> yeah. uh, it's also the reason why, like I said, I don't try to get too much involved with these pictures of bears, of slaughtered rhinos, because I know that that would distract me so much. I would get so hurt and so sad that I wouldn't be able to do my job here because I would, I just can't get my head around it that that's the case. So I sort of need to put that on a lower priority list and trying to influence what I can actually influence, and that is trying to change the behavior. I'm very impressed with what you do, and you have a lot of courage to be able to put that stuff away and not react in the way that I guess I'm embodying the typical reaction, which is <laughs> like... Typical person, yeah. Yeah, it just hits you in the gut. You just, that's the first thing you can think of is you want to call 911 want can we not just fly in the navy seals right now right there and grab those rhinos and just move them as we go to wrap it up with you the recent report from global initiative julian rademeyer very heartbreaking to read these two i read both these reports i'm assuming you're quite familiar with it can you speak to the role that you see in the government there and their role in this crisis? Is the rhino horn arriving in Vietnam through private consumers or is there some level of government complicity in its arrival there? 
it's even worse. There is level of consumption within government as well. So when I said government isn't really working very hard to close the legal loopholes and to enforce the law, it is because they also receive benefits from consumption of rhino horn. Rhino horn is often gifted to superiors. It's often a helpful way to gain a favorable relationship or to maintain a favorable relationship. It shows how powerful you are. So also government officials fall into place with this. And that's why we work a lot with Central Committee for Propaganda and Education because they are these government officials and they have an important role in engaging their colleagues in other government departments. We work with the National Assembly where all the the leaders of all the provinces sit down together twice, three times a year and we have information about the plight of rhinos and we have information about behavior change and what they can do, how Qi can help them and encourage a better society for Vietnam without the risk of their security of the legal wildlife crime. The Wildlife Justice Commission from The Hague delivered a map of facts of Vietnam to Vietnam of a large body of research of illegal wildlife crime in a town close to Hanoi and it's embarrassing like Julian's report it's embarrassing to find out that high local police commissioners are married to the biggest wildlife trader so there is lots of corruption there's lots of benefits of local and national government leaders in this revolt and working with them towards the international wildlife trade conference that will happen in Hanoi following on from the London and Kansani meetings two years and one year ago. It's embarrassing to hear Vietnamese government departments say, how can we deny these reports instead of, okay, well, yes, clearly we're not quite there yet. We need to do a lot of work and we're doing work. We're confiscating items. We are tracking items back. We're trying to get our a chain of custody in place. We are trying to confiscate, we're trying to convict people. And there has been great improvement by the Vietnamese government. But if their first response is to say, how can we deny these reports? How can we deny these facts? You must have not done your research right. It's really disappointing because it doesn't give you any room for improvement. And that is something that we really need to change. I'm doing as much behavior change, not only for consumers, but also for government, trying to influence policy and efficacy here and acceptance that none of us is perfect. Illegal wildlife crime is a transnational problem. It's not only Vietnam's problem. And none of these countries have found the magic bullet to stop this crime, to combat this crime. But you need to accept that it's happening before you can address it. And that isn't happening yet in Vietnam, unfortunately. For the thousands of people who are listening to this as they drive home, usually in this segment, we always give a chance to try to support the organization, whoever we're talking to. Usually, again, it's local nonprofits that are helping the disabled and vulnerable. But when I learned about what's happening to the rhino, and quite frankly, that the cause of it is in the Asia Pacific, where we are located. Mm. I added this as something that we cover. And so when it comes to helping traffic and to try to rally people who are upset, who are listening, who wish that they could do something, what do you recommend to people who are listening right now in terms of whether it's boycotting travel to Vietnam or China, whether it's boycotting goods from there, whether it's sharing things on social media, whether it's donating cash to your mission, whether it's trying to create other missions to support the rhinos. The floor is yours. How do you want people listening to proceed in a way to help you? Behavior change campaigns, are because they're so targeted, are really quite costly. So for us to really address consumer demand, and it's not only rhinos that are in trouble, there's about 4,000 tigers left. Vietnam consumes tigers by the millions in tiger bone glue for arthritis. Rhinos are clear because it's a transnational crime, and they're vastly 
on the path to going extinct because of these demands, which we don't understand from a Western perspective. So trying to change behaviors of targeted audience is quite costly. So if people would like to support this financially or even skills and expertise volunteering here, people that have designer backgrounds and can help us produce brochures, that would be of extreme help for us as well. Because we are such a spread organization, contacting the Vietnam office would make sure that that money is used particularly for addressing behavior change and help to reduce demand for rhinos. And of course, make your friends aware, there's lots of Vietnamese people in America that we know. And it would be great if people can have a chat to their friends and find out if they understand what their family in Vietnam is doing and how that hurts them. And if they can influence their family. We know that from Australia, a fellow NGO working on this, Breaking the Brand from Australia, they know that in Australia, Vietnamese people buy rhino horn over the post to have it sent to their counterparts, to their family here in Vietnam. So we know that that must happen in other countries as well. So if you know somebody Vietnamese, have a chat to them about and find out how they feel about this and try to encourage them to change their behavior. Tell them the whole story because especially the people that live in the USA and in Australia, they have a different perspective. They have a very wealthy life already. They can make different choices than some of the people that are here in Vietnam and quite restricted in their culture when it comes to relationship building and how you maintain your relationships. It's quite a structured culture. Very important. Relationships are key. And that is what is driving this consumption. Definitely, there's lots of different things uh, people can do. Thank you for those very thoughtful suggestions to try to encourage folks to speak to the person who's of Vietnamese origin in your life and try to see where they stand on it as well as obviously making a financial contribution to traffic, and in particular, their office in Vietnam, where you'll be able to see those funds go directly towards this effort. You hear talk from a variety of camps about the legalization of rhino horn, and we've talked with many different kinds of people so far with this program. People who love the animals are at their wits' end in terms of whether or not the legalization of the horn could help. From my personal viewpoint, it doesn't seem at all a reasonable thing to do, but from yourself. Well, traffic doesn't have an official position, but if you look at this from a, and like you said, it doesn't make sense. If you look at this from purely a practical perspective, if a horn, rhino horn was legalized and it became cheaper, more people could afford it. There is Over 1.1 billion Chinese, there is 92 million Vietnamese. If these people all want to and can consume rhino horn because it becomes legal, there's just not enough rhinos in the world. There is not enough stockpile in the world to supply these people with rhino horn. Rhino grow their horns very slowly. How can it work? So just from a practical perspective, it's not a sustainable and viable option. And yes, there is definitely a concern where people that farm or that own wildlife ranches in the range states find these dead animals and are at their wit's end. And I can completely understand their perspective of trying to drive this. But some of these people that are driving this legal trait the hardest are seeing this purely as an economical benefit. They have been stockpiling rhino horn for a long time and they just want to sell it on the market. They see it as an asset. But looking at the long-term viability of this, it's just not feasible. Then come to think of it, the reason why the most prolific rhino horn consumer wants to consume rhino horn is because of that aspect of danger. They like it a little bit illegal. They like it comes from the wild. They don't like artificial rhino horn because they don't like farmed rhino horn because it isn't as special as the wild stuff. It doesn't have as much power as that rhino that was poached, killed, slaughtered to bits and arrives at your doorstep um, so that you can drink it with your friends. So 
I personally am not supportive at all just because the numbers do not add up at all. I couldn't agree with you more. They obviously don't. And it was kind of a question where I already knew the answer, but I just wanted to hear you say it. Because like you pointed out, there are people who own a significant amount of rhinos. They have a lot of horn on their custody. They've tried to make an argument for legalizing it as a way that it, it would cut down on this. But your argument is very solid. And I can't imagine making it more available to that vast number of people. The organization is Traffic. They're online at traffic.org where you can learn more. You can dial in on, as Madeline has very eloquently said, they do a lot more than just rhinos, but you can dial in on what they're doing with the rhinos online at traffic.org. You can contact the office in Vietnam directly to offer support, volunteer to help with their efforts, especially if you've got a design or communications background or expertise with Vietnam, speaking Vietnamese or other cultural or personal connections they could use by reaching their communications officer, Nicholas, at this email address, N-I-K-O-L-A-S dot V-E-I-N-O-T at traffic dot org. And of course, like all of our Helping Hand segments, we archive the full interview, the radio feature, and all of their contact information at our website, hawaiipublicradio.org, where you can find all of our Helping Hand segments online. We've been privileged today to speak with the Country Director for Traffic in Vietnam, Madeline Willemson. Madeline, uh, first, thank you so much for your time today, but most importantly, on behalf of everybody who is rooting you guys on and winning this fight. And on behalf of all the animals, that's the reason I do it, is for the animals themselves, not for the future, not for future generations, not even for the biodiversity. I do it for the individuals that I don't want to see ever go through this. And on behalf of every single rhino that your effort saves, please know that we appreciate it. And if you ever think that getting on the air out here would be worth something to you, don't hesitate to get in touch because it would be an honor to support what you're doing. Great. Thank you very much, David. Your support and I hope the listeners' support is going to be very important because we all need to get together combat the illegal wildlife trade. We can't do it alone. And like you said, I do it for these animals as well. Thank you.